I've done a lot of videos on emulation and they've all ended up somehow scolding Nintendo for having such weak services, but this isn't one of them. This is just going to be a positive, laid-back look at all the breakthroughs and enhancements emulators have been making lately, because there have been a lot of them. BSNES established itself as the best all-around Super Nintendo emulator a while ago, with cycle-accurate emulation alongside great enhancement options like HD Mode 7. Widescreen support was one of the most exciting additions, but it never really got off the ground. It required games to be patched individually, and the mods weren't exactly forthcoming. That seems to be changing now. The only prior widescreen patch, Uxessi's Super Metroid hack, is still in progress and has been updated since the last time I showed it. It's becoming more of a general quality of life improvement, with faster door transitions and elevator speeds. 80% of the time it looks amazing, but a lot of things still have to be polished before it's ready for use. The bigger news is that there's now a second and mostly complete mod for Super Mario World by a modder named Vitor. He painstakingly fixed the hundreds of issues that emerged when expanding the game's screen, and even managed to fix a few glitches that were in the original release. The result is a game that feels like it was designed this way from the start. A lot of the levels are linear rooms or caves that stretch on for long distances and make natural showcases for widescreen. And to get this out of the way right now, most of the footage isn't truly 16x9 because I'm playing with the narrower 1 to 1 pixel mapping. The screen is filled when playing with the 4 3 proportions, and like my body, it will also support ultra wide ratios. The mod is more than a visual tweak and the extra width changes the difficulty in some levels. It's much easier to dash through stages now that you can see more of what's ahead, but I doubt many people will object to that since Super Mario World was never that tough anyway. The higher speed just makes it more fun to play. Scrolling levels see a bigger difficulty nerf due to the added space Mario can escape to at the edges of the screen, but these were also never hard to navigate in the first place. Any difficulty loss is made up for by how much harder projectile-based levels become. Soda Lake normally begins with a safe screen before moving into the torpedo launchers, but in widescreen the torpedoes are in view and firing from the very start, and they'll continue firing after you've passed them up, dramatically increasing the number of hazards that have to be dealt with at once. After struggling with this new Bullet Hell version, the original feels like a total cakewalk. And this is a good thing. If you've played Super Mario World to death, then the new balancing will be a refreshing change of pace, but without losing the original feel of the game. The mod also adds SA1 support in order to power a lot of the changes that had to be made. The SA-1 was a coprocessor included on some cartridges, similar to the Super FX chip. According to Vitor, it could increase the processing power of the system fivefold and allow for better performance and more sprites. Because the SA-1 was similar to the Super Nintendo's default processor, it's possible to force its use in games that were never designed for it. Vitor has taken advantage of this by creating patches for a handful of games with performance issues, like Gradius 3 and Contra. Even on a powerful PC, these games will lag because the original clock speeds are being emulated. But with the SA-1 patches, everything is silky smooth regardless of how intense the action gets. If you can't see the difference, trust me, you can feel it. From here, he plans to make patches for many other games, and hopefully more members of the emulation community will be inspired to do the same. Thirty years ago, it would have been unthinkable that these games could be enhanced this much and that people would still be actively working on them so many years later. And it makes me wonder how much better these games will get years down the road from now. What you're looking at is an NES game, running the 8-bit equivalent of a texture pack. This news is a little older, but if you dust it off, it's still just fine. Mason was discontinued last year, but it's still one of the most modern and accurate NES emulators, and it's the only one to support high-res sprite packs. Modders have taken advantage of this to boost the audio and visuals up to the 16-bit level or beyond, with surprisingly convincing results. The Zelda Remastered patch has lots of new animations and looks like a full-on remake, which is interesting because Nintendo did an actual 16-bit remake of the game on the Satellaview system. If you had never heard of this before, it's because the game ended up in the massive pile of stuff that never made it overseas. It gave the music and visuals a Mario All-Star style treatment and made some tweaks to the gameplay. You can be the judge of which version looks best, but at the very least the new HD mod is extremely competitive. The Metroid pack has slightly janky animations, but is otherwise pretty close to the look of Super Metroid. And most surprisingly, it actually adds a working map to the pause screen. If you want to play a 16-bitted up version of Metroid, I do have to question why you wouldn't choose Zero Mission or Super Metroid itself. But this is by far the most playable way to experience the 1986 release. As a side note, the developer of BSNES HD has loose plans to eventually bring similar features to SNES games as well. Meaning there's a chance to finally make the Super Duper Metroid 8K photo realism pack I've always wanted to. This is one of the great strengths of the unofficial emulator community. Developers pay attention to what other emulators are doing and bring those features into their own work when possible. MGBA, or MGBA, is another example of this. Last year it added support for HD Affine graphics, basically accomplishing the same thing BSNES HD had done for Mode 7. And more recently, the developers worked with the Dolphin team to better emulate GameCube connectivity. 
meaning you can run two different emulators for two different systems in tandem in order to work your tingle tuner, which is kind of nuts. On the Dolphin side, there aren't many specific new features to report, but the emulator has continued to make huge strides with bug fixes and accuracy improvements. One of the longest running problems the emulator has had is that the soundtracks for the Resident Evil games were completely bugged and couldn't work without hacks. A few months ago, they finally discovered that it was the game's fault more than it was Dolphin's. Capcom had mistakenly set the audio buffers to clear too early, and the music only worked on the GameCube hardware because another instruction set cancelled the first one out. Dolphin wasn't emulating the second set of instructions, so Capcom's bug suddenly mattered. The Dolphin team could have quit five or six years ago and it would still be one of the most mature and competent emulators ever made, but the fact that they're still chipping away at it at the same pace as ever is inspiring. Some of Dolphin's quality has bled over into PlayStation territory, with one of the developers creating a new emulator called Duck Station. It even borrowed Dolphin's interface, and one of its big innovations for improving frame pacing has found its way back into Dolphin. Duck Station has good accuracy, but also allows major enhancements to the resolution and general image quality. The PlayStation sucked so badly at being the PlayStation that polygons would warp and wiggle in motion, and Duck Station's geometry corrections can fix this. It also has a widescreen hack that works pretty well in everything I tested. The developer, Stenzek, has also just begun working on custom texture support, and has already achieved complete global fat Yoshi saturation. Almost all of the big games from this system have been remade or ported to newer hardware, but the PlayStation library was so huge that there's still a mountain of software that depends on emulation, and Duck Station seems like a major upgrade going forward. The last thing I want to note is that Project 64 recently turned 20 years old and hit version 3.0, marking the first numbered change in about 8 years. Zilmar intends to maintain it alongside a new 4.0 version that will focus on cycle-accurate emulation, which is something that's been attempted before but never achieved yet. Project 64 has been far from perfect, but it has shown pretty incredible endurance in its two decades of development. So if this project is going for cycle accuracy, it's a safe bet that we'll get it. And thanks to the Glide N64 plugin, there's already an incredible amount of enhancement possible, including support for every depth-based effect Reshade offers. This is by no means all the news out there, but it's all that a dumb fraud like me can handle at the moment. There will always be an occasional naysayer claiming that emulators are all about piracy, but the emulation community constantly demonstrates that it's full of very smart people with an unshakable commitment to getting every last detail right, long after their projects are already good enough. And we should all be thankful that gaming history is in their hands. If you want to try any of these projects out, I've included links to all of them in the description. And as always, like that smash button, ring that bell, through the cord. Your demographic likes this kind of stuff, right? Pack your Gibson, drink your oval team. Get over here! You remember that? I'm losing them. Computer, pull the plug. Computer. No, no, no. Pull the plug. Keep fing that chicken. Number nine. Number nine. Number nine. Number eight. Number nine. Sorry.